I want to speak to you this morning about winning spiritual battles. How to win a spiritual battle. And the thing we really have to get a hold of is, is that the battle is already won. Jesus won the spiritual battle at the cross. But there's still a part that we have to play. We have to enforce, just like a police officer enforces the law. The police officer does not make the law. He does not come up with uh, ways to, to uh, apprehend criminals. It's already, it's already been established for him. All he, he wears a badge, he has a gun, he has a uniform, and he enforces something that has already happened. So that's what we are. We are enforcers. We resist the devil and we enforce what already has happened. Jesus took away the keys of authority from the devil. He has no authority. Everything that he does is illegal. So what's happening here in the world Today is there's a battle, battle going on. There's a warfare going on. And if you like, you can consider it like this. There are two kingdoms waging war against each other. But the truth is that one kingdom has already been defeated. And that's the kingdom of Satan. But he'll still try to deceive you. He'll keep people hostage even though Jesus has set them free, has given us all authority, the devil, if he can fool you into thinking you are nothing, you are worthless, you are a failure, he can keep you captive to that. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus came and he said, he quoted this in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, he said, I have come to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. Yeah. And uh, it, it's all a matter of having the right knowledge. Amen. The knowledge of what Jesus has already done. And that will give you uh, the step to first base at least to know that you are a spiritual warrior. You've already been given authority to Pronounce the name of Jesus. Pronounce the words of God that have already been spoken. You can claim that you are more than a conqueror and an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Genesis chapter 4. And it's, it's, it's funny that this starts out this way. A spiritual battle was raging between two brothers. God received Abel's offering because it was the way God instructed him to bring offerings. His best. That's the way it's always been. God wants your best. And a lot of times it's, it's your money. A lot of times it's your heart. It's, it's your life. He wants the best of you. So in chapter 4 of Genesis, it tells us that Cain was mad. And God could see it. And God said, Cain, why has your countenance fallen? In other words, if somebody's mad or somebody's down and, and, and real grouchy, you can tell, can't you? Their countenance on their face demonstrates what's in their heart. And so here's, here's what it says in, in verse 4, Genesis 4, 4. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? This is a good lesson. Listen up to this. If you do well, God said to Cain, will you not be accepted? And its desire, see, the, if you do not do well, sin 
lies at the door. Matter of fact, some translations say this, that sin crouches at the door in wait for you. Or you could say it another way, the devil and his wicked ways lies in wait for you to fall into his traps, to fall into his, into his ways. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So what should you do? The devil comes to tempt you. He comes to, he uses other people to persecute you. He uses deception to trick you out of your rightful privileges that you have as a child of God. And what you should do is rule over his wicked ways. And you, you do not have the power in yourself, but you have been endued with power from on high if you have the Holy Spirit baptism. If you have the name of Jesus, you can stick out your shield of faith and say, I resist you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Oh, the devil would like to weaken your faith. He would like to have you fall trap and be fall into emotional situations, and that will get you into trouble every time. Anger, jealousy, envy, all of those things. We know that from reading our Bibles. We know that, and it's a trap of the enemy. If he can get you to loosen up a little bit and not be so stiff with that shield of faith, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, then he'll, he'll get you to fall into his trap. Even Christians, even Christians fall into his trap sometimes. Don't even, don't even fall for a hint. Get rid of it immediately if you're being tempted, if you're being harassed or oppressed by the devil. And he oppresses with sickness and trouble. Jesus, Jesus went about doing good. Jesus said he was baptized with the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Not possessed, but just oppressed, pushed down. That's what sickness does to you. So if you're in a spiritual battle, then when you wage war and claim your healing, you're getting a victory in a spiritual battle. Amen. This is good stuff. Yeah. This is good stuff to know. You can win your spiritual battles. Yeah. Now let me show you a couple of things how sometimes the devil can get his way and well, let's just look at a couple of things. What is a spiritual battle? A spiritual battle, you need to, if you're going to win, you're going to have to be prepared. If you do not know the word of God, then you need to get busy. That's our main job as a believer. If you want to be a believer, you need to be a Bible reader. Jesus was a Bible reader. He quoted the word of God wherever he went. We imitate Jesus. We imitate God as dear children, the Bible says. So the other thing is we got to be on guard because the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you haven't had your Bible open in a long time, you need to open it because he's looking for you. <laughs> He's on the prowl for those that don't know the word of God. Because you're weak in faith. If you don't eat food, I'm talking about physical food, and you don't drink water, you become weak. And spiritually, it's the same way. These words that Jesus spoke, words that the Holy Spirit wrote, in a book, Inspired Holy Men to Write, these words are spiritual food. 
You need spiritual food to be strong. Otherwise, you're going to be weak. You could say amen or you can say oh me <laughs> and get busy. The word of God is really true. And then you need to trust the Lord. I trust God's word way more than I used to. Every day I'm gaining on him. I'm gaining my trust. Trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding, the Bible says. And he will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord. See, if, if you're always wondering and wavering, <laughs> then you're going to be tossed to and fro. By a, you need to study the word of God so much that you believe it with all your heart. Yeah. And even the things that you don't understand, it's okay. I believe it all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I believe every word spoken by God. It's important. A lot of people have questions. A lot of people have questions. And it's funny how I've run into a lot of people like this. People question, well, what about those people that have never heard about Jesus? Yeah. What about this? And, and what, where, you know, wh why is there so many wars? And where is God? And why did God let this happen? It, you know, all that is wondering and wavering. And you'll never come to a point where you trust the Lord fully when you're still wavering and wondering. See, what you need to know is you need to know that God gave authority to the children of men. God owns the earth. It's his. But he gave charge of it to Adam. Adam gave it away. Jesus went to the cross and was buried to buy it back. So we, not the people of the old covenant, but people in the new covenant, have the authority, the same authority that Adam had in the beginning. Jesus gave it back to us. So we have authority, and now, not only that, we've been given power since the day of Pentecost. We've been given the mighty name of Jesus, which is above every name. The name of Jesus is above the name of Satan, the name of cancer, the name of every heart disease. The name of Jesus is higher. Amen. You can relax and believe God just knowing that. Jesus' name, if you don't know what else to say, say, say the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So here's, here's some things, too, that I want you to look at. Three reasons why Satan gets an advantage of us. You could write this down if you want. Number one is lack of knowledge. The Word of God says, and you can look at this up later, in Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people perish... For a lack of knowledge. A lot of people just don't know. A lot of people, even people that go to church, have might be, I, I know people that go to church, but they don't know that Jesus has gave them the victory. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to have victory. We may have a problem that comes up and rises up, but we having the name of Jesus and the word of God, the sword of the spirit coming out of our mouth, we can overcome the enemy yes. in the name of Jesus. If you really know something, if you really, really, truly know something, you're going to live that something. Amen. I'll tell you a little story while we're talking about a lack of knowledge. Because, you see, you could have... You could know a lot of Bible verses and yet not apply them. You could know a lot of Bible knowledge. You could have it and not know how to apply it. Or you, you'll be, maybe you'll be caught in a situation by surprise and you're 
ruled, and you don't even know it, you're ruled before you know it by your emotions instead of by faith that will cause the victory to come. I'll tell you, it happened to me. Back, this was quite a few years ago, I was a Bible studier. I would actually, I was studying the Rhema Bible course at the time. I was actually, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, this is just setting up the, the, the fall that I had. <laughs> I was actually the president of a local chapter of the Full Gospel Businessmen in Birmingham, Bloomfield area. And I was doing some other things, okay? So I was, I had some Bible knowledge, but there were some things underlying that I don't really believe at the time I was fully operating in it. And it was revealed when all of a sudden my mom, who was, she was kind of sickly in her life, but she, she battled through and not necessarily by the power of God, but her own power. She was a pretty positive person most of the time. But she had this great big seizure. And it really wasn't an epileptic seizure. It was some kind of a strange thing. I don't know. I can't really describe it. Just all of a sudden, she just blanked out. And she was staring off into space. And there were a lot of people around. My, matter of fact, it was some kind of a holiday. Uh, I think it might have been Thanksgiving. And we were all gathered together, cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents and all this. And, and she blanked out, and no one could bring her to have her attention. Yet she was, she was looking, she was breathing, everything, but she was just nothing. No response to anything. And of course, immediately, I, I wanted to lay hands on her and speak the name of Jesus, but I was overcome with emotion and fear. My faith did not take root, and my words of prayer, I spoke the right words, but I didn't believe any of it. That can happen. If you, Jesus said this, we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. You can have a lot of information, you can have a lot of knowledge, but have no revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge means you put it into practice. You work at it. It's your work out your own salvation means... You live your faith. And I was living my faith. Yes, I was. I was not off into sin, but I was taken by surprise. And, of course, entering into it was, this is my mom, right? So you have to be aware, and part of the lack of knowledge that some of us have is that we shouldn't be taken by surprise. The devil should never have the upper hand. We should know fear when it comes. If fear does come, you need to deal with it immediately. Deal with your fear. Deal with your emotions. Just like it was in right in here where God told Cain, you should have ruled over you should have taken dominion over your emotions of anger before it got out of control. Is anybody with me here? Yes. You see, what I'm talking about is your emotions can cause you to waver and to wonder. And then I could have gone out of there thinking, well, I don't know why it didn't work. Why didn't God do what he said he was going to do? But it was all the time it was me. I was totally in fear. Name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, devil. <laughs> Anybody ever been there besides me? Yeah. Listen, it's a real situation, and we need to talk about it sometimes. 
God is not the one who fails. Love never fails. <laughs> it's just a word to the wise. You see, we should, have, we should have wisdom. You know what wisdom is? Different than knowledge. Knowledge would be like this. Knowledge would, would be to know that tomatoes are a fruit. But wisdom would tell you, don't put tomatoes in your fruit salad. <laughs> All right, you'll catch it later. <laughs> it, it means, you know, wisdom will tell you how to apply knowledge. So we should be asking God for wisdom all the time. And wisdom would, would warn us because even, even the words of God tell us, don't let envy and strife and all these kinds of other things enter in. Keep yourself pure. Don't have anything against anyone. Let it go. Forgive. When you stand praying, forgive. All those, all those emotional kind of things we need to deal with before we speak and have the mountains move. Yeah. It's all Bible sense. It's all Bible wisdom. So the second thing then that the devil can take advantage of you are, and, and uh, listen, turn, uh, we need to turn to this one scripture that is going to help us um, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And let me look it up real quick here because I didn't write it down. Ephesians 2. This is, this is something I mentioned last week, but we need to bring it up again. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, that in, and let's go to verse 2. In which you once watched, or Let's try verse 1. And you, Jesus, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. See, once we were in the world, but, but since we have Jesus as our Savior, God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So we don't walk that way anymore. According to the prince of of the power of the air. See, the prince of the power of the air, the devil would like to sway you to get back into the world and look to the world for supplying your needs. Be in the world instead of in the house of God and in, in the presence of God and in the word of God and, and lead, led by the Holy Spirit of God. So according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So if you are a son who is disobedient, the devil can take advantage of you. He can get an advantage over you if you have a lack of knowledge or if you want to remain disobedient. Disobedient would be in the last days, the Bible says this, in the last days, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. You should be gathered together with believers, especially when you see the day approaching. What day? The day of the end of the times. Yeah, gather together with other believers, not always gather together with the unbelievers. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So those are a couple of things. Third one is give away control. The devil wants control. The Holy Spirit does not want to control you. God does not want to control you. He wants you to submit yourself to him. God, take my life. Take my life. Receive me. Use me in your kingdom. You submit yourself. The Bible says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. You, I know a lot of religious, there are some religious sayings where people say, Lord, humble me 
<laughs> God is not going to humble you because he doesn't control you. In other words, like the devil wants to control you. He can tr control you if he can tempt you to get off into his ways. Drugs and alcohol, and those are his, his weapons. If he can get you into the grips of addiction, and it could be anything. It could be television. It could be the computer. If he can get you to be addicted, to, you're under his control. God wants you to freely give yourself to him. And when you freely give yourself to him, awesome things will happen. He'll show you things to come. He'll lead you and guide you in all your ways and into the truth. God is so good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, a couple of things. Here's three reasons, too, that you can reign in life. And let's look at this scripture, Romans chapter 5. Let's look at this one. This is so powerful. You see, the believer should have the upper hand on the devil. He's already defeated. The only reason he can defeat you is if he can deceive you into not knowing what power you really have. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. And it, this is really a summation of everything that Jesus did. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through one. What's he talking about here? Adam's offense. Adam sinned. Death reigned throughout humanity because of Adam's sin. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying here. For if one man's offense, death reigned through that one, but on the other hand, much more those who receive the abundance of grace through Jesus have and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. There's your difference. Jesus bought back the authority that Adam once had and gave away. So the word of God tells us right there that we have a gift. You are not righteous on your own, but you have been given a gift. What that means is, I know some people, some people automatically fall back on that thing. Well, you think you're more righteous than all of us. Unbelievers will tell you, right? No, we're not righteous in that kind of a way. We're not, we're not braggadocious and, and saying, oh, I'm better than you. No, no, we're not saying that at all. That's not the, what the word righteous means. Righteous means it's an old English word meaning right with God. I'm in right standing with God. Old English will say that. So we have been given the gift of being right with God when we confess Jesus as our Savior. Amen? Amen. Yes, you are. So you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're right with God in Christ. Amen. Don't let those old English words fool you. The devil can take advantage of you if you let him. So, if you have the gift of being in right standing and an abundance of grace, which means the same thing really, then you will reign in life through Christ Jesus. Reign in life, what does that mean? The Amplified says, reign in life as a king. And of course, the Bible tells us that we should grow to maturity so that we're a fully mature believer and become a priest and a king unto God. Kings rule. When a king speaks something, things happen. Isn't that right? You should believe when you speak, because you're a child of God, something happens. 
And also we're a priest because we spend time on our knees before the Lord. We're in prayer. We're in communication. Not only do we speak to the Lord, but we listen to the Lord as a priest. Amen. So we need to know who we are and what we have, number one. Number two, take authority just like a police officer does, and resist the devil. See, if you don't resist him, he'll just keep coming back and make himself comfortable in your household <laughs> if you let him. But you have to speak up. Blow your police whistle and say, no, you can't come in this house. Your house should be a holy place where you pray, where you believe God. Amen. Amen. And the third thing, we need to spend time in prayer, asking, listening, submitting, agreeing with other believers, giving of thanks, and confession is prayer. And I want you to turn to another scripture before we close. This will be the last one. Let's see, Isaiah 46. Please turn there and I will read it to you. But this is so powerful about confession. And here, here's something I, 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 uh, <laughs> I came across this little story about a, a young priest. You see, all the things that God has given us, wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says that we have wisdom and knowledge and ability in all things that pertain to life and godliness. Amen. God has already given that to us. And so we do have that knowledge. We have knowledge. We have wisdom. We, if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead us and guide us into all the truth. And we'll not make as many mistakes as we always have. A young priest, though, he was... He was uh, being evaluated by a senior priest. I don't know how they, what, what actually they call themselves. Monsignor or something. Uh, you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> a young priest just starting out and an older priest, okay? He's evaluating the young priest. And so the young priest was in the confessional. This is just a joke, okay? <laughs> don't take offense at it if, you, if you're a Catholic. Uh, He's, he's, he's listening to communion, I mean, uh, confession, <laughs> communion. <laughs> I'm all getting all, uh, my, my tongue got in the way of my eye tooth. I couldn't see what I was saying. My, uh, the, the young priest, he was listening to these confessions. And so the, the older priest was watching and, and he was uh, listening to what was going on. And so later on, uh, the uh, young the young man was called over by the older priest and he said, I'd like to give you a little counsel. He said, you know, when you're listening to confession, you need to respond a, a little bit different than, wow. <laughs> okay, come on, get serious again, okay. I don't know why I thought of that. Just, it just came to me. Wow. Isaiah 46 Verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God. This is God speaking to you and to me. And there is no other. I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. God declares things in the future, things that haven't happened yet. You know, some people, some people will say, well, God has all foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen before they happen. And then some people that are unbelievers or Believers that are wavering will say, why doesn't God do something? If he already knows it's going to happen, why doesn't he do something? That's not the kind of foreknowledge that the word of God is talking about here. Let me show you. I am God. 
There is none like me. He doesn't operate like we do when our carnal minds are in operation. He is always in the spirit. He is above all. He rides upon the high places of the earth. His ways are higher than our ways. So when God has, if you want to say, God has foreknowledge, it's because he's already spoken. And what he speaks will be done. It's not that he is having this knowledge of something other than what he has already spoken. And the good things that God has already spoken, if believers do not join themselves with what God has spoken, the devil will use those spiritual laws against you. In other words, because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of putting your knowledge to work. That's why I love that saying that says, <laughs> I can't remember the saying. <laughs> no. <laughs> the word will work if you work it. The word will work if you work it. But if you don't work the word, it won't work, and the devil will fill the gap. He'll take advantage of your lack of working knowledge. You could think of it that way, working knowledge. So let's keep reading here. Verse 10, let's read that again. Declaring the end from the giving, beginning. See, God already knows how it's all going to turn out. He already knows. He has already proclaimed what was going to happen with the Lord Jesus. He's already proclaimed that, declared that, that Jesus was going to come like a baby, like a lamb to the slaughter, to suffer and die for the whole world. And then he was going to raise from the dead just like just like it was written, Jesus said, it would be just like the days of Noah. And it would be just like Jonah. He gave, he gave that you'd be buried for three days in the belly of the earth instead of the belly of the whale. And then he would rise in again. And then he would go to heaven. And then the second time that Jesus would come to planet earth, he would come as the king. He is the king right now. Amen. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And when he comes back, he will judge. Here come the judge. He's going to judge the world. Amen. I thank you for I'm saved. I'm sanctified. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Born again. Amen. I don't want to be judged by the king. No. Declaring the end from the beginning. See, if you attach yourself, uh, I need a volunteer. Somebody volunteer. I need somebody. Laura, come on up here. Up on stage here for a second. See, you have to put yourself, attach yourself to the Lord Jesus. Just stand right there. You're in the right place right there. If you stay out there and do your own thing, you're on your own. You need to jump on board with what God has already said. What, God, what things God has already declared from the beginning, he's declared what the end was going to be, the end result. Now listen to what it says. And... And from ancient days, the things which are not yet done. Hold on to your second. Yeah, I'll get to you in a minute. Saying, how did he declare the end from the beginning? 
by saying. Can you see that in your Bible? Saying, my counsel shall stand. Or in other words, my words will stand. And I will do all my pleasure. God will do what he wants to do. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel far from, from a far country, indeed I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. What? His words. What he says. Whatever he declared is what God is going to do. No wonder he knows how it's going to all work out. But if you know how the Lord Jesus, from the foundation, the Bible says, from the foundation of the world, it was established, the secret mystery of God was established that Jesus would rule and reign. Amen. Our job is to hook up with Jesus and say the same thing that Jesus said. Can, can you see how powerful your confession of faith is when you say, by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed? You're hooking up with what God has already declared from the beginning. He declared your ending and it would be healed by the stripes of Jesus. See, you're not playing games with confession. You're not playing games by confessing the word of God. My God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And if he has to, if God has to, if you're a believer and you're hooked to what God has already proclaimed, maybe you don't have any money, God will send a raven to feed you. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. You don't have any money, he'll send you to go fishing. And the first fish you catch will have gold in its mouth. God will make sure his word comes to pass. Praise the Lord. Come on, all stand up. Come on, let's give God thanks. You can go back and sit down. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. We're hooked together. We're hooked together with Jesus. Whatever happened to Jesus will happen to me. If he rose from the dead, I'll raise from the dead. Praise God. Hallelujah.